job, so right, so he said that. We need to do that when we switch them over. No, you just keep them on. Okay, um, Zan, you first. How you doing, Courtney? Just keep talking. Just keep talking. Yeah, okay. All right, Marty, you next. I think you're on mute. You are on mute. Well, that's not good. Okay, go again. Good morning, Courtney. Perfect. That's great. Okay, there's a uh, Todd. Okay. Oh, am I on? Yeah, just keep it on. Are you ready? I'm ready. Touch is that easy? Definitely. I'm just going to hit, yeah. If, I'm just, okay. like between myself and BP, we can switch it if we yeah. need to. Yeah. Well, there's two of them. Hey, Zan. Are we each going to have them? Yeah. It looks like most of our guys are going to come in late. Darcy, good, how you doing? Good. And then are you, what happens, what happens if, if you, do I maybe have to use you as a clicker? Just, and, and yeah, just that's forward, that's back. How's that? What's up, Phil? How are you? Good. Hey, thanks for coming. Good to see you. When you guys run weekend ads, will you make sure the next week it's not cheaper for the whole week?
Yeah, so you're not recording us. Yeah. You're just it's that's voice. What, you can see. what? Oh, that's what she can see. Yeah, that's what you can see. So are you going to start from over there? Yeah. I'm starting right here. Oh, I don't know. It's not PowerPoint. Yes, right here. Right here. Right here. Oh my gosh. Behind you. You want to mute your mic if you're not going to be talking. It's just the. Um, yep. Yeah, just that we don't, we don't get the background noise. So we. Else. And then when you're ready to talk, I'll okay. remind you to unmute it. Everybody has the mic. There's a mute button on top. It's just. Did I just yell in your ear? Okay. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, we ready? Hang on just one nope, second. Let me get out of the way. So this mute button right here, you just push it to the side that says mute. So, yeah, so if it's close to the mute, that means it's muted. If it's further away, that means you're good to go. Okay. September 11th, 2019, meet seminar when grocers inspire superfan mentality. Next. How to, uh, that was this. That was your first cue. You lost it. Come on, Zach, keep up. Uh, we want to thank everybody here that's in attendance. We're doing a live presentation. We were doing a WebEx, now we're doing a YouTube. But, and then we we're recording this so it can be accessed by the stores at a later date. Uh, thanks to Bridgerland for uh, their tech, Sterling. Thanks to our tech. Thanks to uh, Jason and John and Scott, uh, Bridgerland helping us out and making this all available. They do have a training program here at Bridgerland. That's what they do. And we want to use those as a resource for our stores. So keep that in mind. Uh, Marty, has, one of his objectives is to develop a training program that, is, that can be utilized at retail for our stores. Uh, thank our, our meat sales team. That's going to be presenting. First, we're going to have uh, Steve and Jordan doing some uh, uh, grill cuts. Then we're going to have uh, Travis and Brent doing some pork. And then we're going to turn it over to Thomas Brown. And then we're going to turn it over to the chef, Laura, from the National, uh, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And then we're going to cook some stuff and uh, then send you, send you up to the Bridgeland facility. Uh, interactions with the audience. So if they will be coming in, so we'll pause. Zach will have, you'll receive it. Or you can text. You can text your cells. Uh, people that are away, that are uh, watching it via YouTube, can text your cell specialist. And then we can answer and filter the questions and uh, address some of that. So the focus. How to, super, uh, how to inspire super fan mentality, how to brand your departments, how to be the protein destination, and how to inspire customers that are loyal to us. So I listed some uh, stores that uh, do a great job along the Wasatch Front and, and across the country. Let me just point out some of their programs, how they've, uh, how they've gone to market. Kroger. People don't care what they pay. Some people don't care what they pay. They just, they just use it to get points for the gas program. 
They just go in the shop and then they accumulate. They don't even think about it. Uh, they have to do a great service case program. But what they do best, from my perspective, they have the best family pack program out there. They do a wonderful job. They tell you on the ticket how much you <laughs> save. They put it on a sticker that you saved, $11 on this package. They do a great job. Whole Foods, they do a great job. They, they've branded themselves incredibly well. They have a great uh, seafood case. Uh, they have an exit strategy for their seafood case. They, uh, they smoke it in-house, so there's no shrink. Perfect exit strategy on a high-end item. Uh, Sprouts, in-source sausage program, second to no one. They, they do an incredible job there. It's a destination. Produce promotions are famous for that. Costco. Costco, if anybody shopped at Costco, you've bought a roaster at $4.99. They, they're not making any money off that program. They are the, uh, I like to call them the uh, country club of grocery. You have to pay, to, you have to be a member to get in. So they make 60 to 120 bucks off of you before you walk in the door. And then you go for toilet paper and it costs you another 100 bucks. So they've made 100 and, or 220, 100, I don't know how, however, whatever membership you sign up for. That's how good they are. They're incredible. They have a perceived value. Uh, Winco, they're the pr low price leader. They have compare signs. They do an incredible job. And even though they're the low price leader, they have poke. They have Mrs. Meyer's uh, cleaning supplies. That's a high end. That's a high end product. So they, they do an incredible job. Walmart, we know Walmart, they variety in price. We have a great beef program. The value they see in that, they, as an investment to brand themselves, uh, they have, they're, they're in doing it right now. They're, uh, bring it, they'll bring it to market. They've brought in a, in a small market, they've brought it to market, but they, they're sourcing, they're feeding, they're processing, they're packaging, and delivering a, a beef program to their stores. So they've kind of had a reputation for not having great meats and stuff. Watch out. Uh, who haven't hit? Oh, next slide. Sprouts. Oh, uh, Trader Joe's. I hit Sprouts. Trader Joe's. They are the best at, at branding themselves. They, their, their name is on everything. The private labels is, is incredible. They have a, uh, the super fan mentality. They uh, have a cult following. People are proud to shop. Uh, they, they tell you where, where they shop. But they've done a great job of, of branding and marketing themselves. Next slide. Albertsons. Look at the investment they've made to brand themselves and be the destination for a service case. Salmon Creek Farm pork, $12 a pound, in-house sausage, and I think some of you stores have been up to see this. And I'm going to just go through these pretty quick because I just want to point out, look at the price points. And the pork belly, next. Uh, same thing here. Uh, is it Salmon Creek Farms, uh, ribeyes 26. Can you guys see that pretty good? Is that a yes? Uh, King Salmon, $28 a pound. Sea Bass, $30 a pound. This was their sell item. Atlantic Salmon at $8.99. And halibut, those are portions. Halibut portions, and so yeah, that's around 30 bucks a pound. Keep going. $45 a lobster each, that's a pound, and they're about a pound and a half. But just it's the clientele they're going after, and they're doing a great job of it. Next. Here's another company within the Albertsons organi organization that's branded uh, under the Lucky Banner. Same deal, but look at how they're branding themselves and appealing to their de demographics and becoming a destination. Look at their, their price points. Nothing even close to $30 a pound. Keep going. I mean, it's incredible that they can sell a fillet of tilapia at $297, $297. Although the lobster is the same as the high end Albertsons. Keep going. Keep going. 
Okay, here's a beef program. You know, we, we can match this, but look at their exit strategy. You think they have one? It goes from here to seasoned to the restaurant up front. Zero shrink. They're doing, a, they're doing a great job. They're appealing to their demographics. Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to. Okay, so what do we do? What tools do we have to brand ourselves? To, to become, to create that super fan mentality, to be a protein destination and develop loyal customers. Today, the team's gonna talk on grill cuts. We're gonna focus on grill cuts, one pot ready chef and the uh, Smithfield uh, program. But actually, we wanna encourage you guys to use all of these. I'm gonna just speak to uh, a couple that's been working and I'll just go, just being as we have the audience, we're gonna go to the next slide. This program right here. So a lot of you are on a CAB program. Best program out there. I mean, we can, we can brand ourselves on that. It's an incredible program. We have high loin meat. I'm proud of it. People that want a loin meat, they'll, they'll pay the difference. There's a, there's a, there's a reason they, they shop your stores for that quality. We want to take that program to a mid-tier. We want to take the end meats and create other cuts. We always said that there's no more pieces of the cow. We're not use, you, we're not, we've never utilized all the cow. There's other things out there. We've listed them in the program. The guys are going to cut some of them today. But this is an opportunity to go to market with a mid-tier, a $6.99 steak that performs better than that select steak down the street. We can be $4.99, so we can run an ad, a cross rib ad, and our procurement team always goes after the flat irons, so we can take every flat iron off of there and go $6.99 and utilize every one. We're gonna cut uh, uh, the heart of the clod today and take a ranch steak and turn that into a grillable experience and go $4.99. We're not using the whole cow. This program makes that available to us. Uh, bistro tenders, we have some, Marty brought that, uh, Marty brought that uh, to us when he came on board, and that's, that's a great opportunity, a mid-tier steak program. The Sierra Cup, it's just, like I say, the Denver steak, all these are just, and then we can, we can for, off that program, we can do high-end stuff too, and further merchandise and get baseball steaks, make them a signature item, become the destination, develop that loyal base of customers. Uh, like I say, you gotta train your customers. When Marty uh, first was selling CAB, he uh, like, what do you do at Associated Foods? How do you sell this program? Nobody wanted to get on board. One customer at a time, that's what I think I've told him. You gotta do it one at a time. And so he backdoored it. Went to Lee's, went to other, you know, just one at a time. And now, there was a point when I was having to tell customers, no, we gotta get enough product in the pipeline, we, uh, we got to get do our homework, we got to get more. Anyway, half our business is on a CAB program. So what we encourage on this program, if you're not licensed, at least utilize the higher end choice so you have a good eating experience with these mid-tier cuts. You don't have to, you, don't, you can't put the name on it, but you can utilize the product. Okay, next slide. Like I say, and so uh, th those who are on the program, the, the 10 specs, and it comes down to flavor and juiciness because of the marbling, because uh, of the maturity, the size, and then, the, uh, the, then they have the specs for uh, tenderness and uh, appearance. Next slide. Okay, we brought this to market a little while ago. Uh, you know, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a fun, it was fun. Uh, it got some heat. But we went to market at 99 cents for 10 pounds of meat, for 10 bucks, you get 10 pounds of meat. That will feed 20 people. That's 50 cents a serving. Where else can you do that? And you can make 20%, depending on how you blend the loin and rib chops. You go 50-50. I tried to do this yesterday on a new ad. The, the loin meat was 117. The sirloin ends were in the 80s. I tried to blend it at 97, and then steal some chops. 
I want to do this so bad and steal every center. Why not? We need to steal the centers right now for, I should merchandise the centers, sorry. Merchandise the centers for, and Travis again, and Brown again talked to us, a rack of pork, freeze them. We don't know what the market's going to do. I would, you can buy this right now at 117 You can sell them at $3.99. That's what it's going to cost you to buy a rack of pork in the holidays. Go crazy with this stuff. Set yourself up for success. You got to buy it. You can't sell it if you don't have it. There's other few cliches I can't say, but there's <laughs> buy it to sell it. You got to be in the business. You got to be that protein destination. Like I say, there's margins in this product. We can have some fun with this program. It's an incredible. Is this new? No. People have been eating for years from the beginning of time. People have been eating. All we're doing is feeding people. And it, it's, it's, hey, we're rebranding it. Are, are grill cuts new? Yeah, well, it's BAM. It's beef alternative merchandising. Then it was smart cuts. We, had to get, we gave it a name. Grill cuts, it makes sense. That's our program, that's your program. Okay, next. Do the same thing with beef. When you have a roast on there, this should be in your family pack section every day of the week, that line price with your roast. Next. Okay, one pot meals, it breaks today. First time ever at Associated Foods, this program. You know, we've had a few phone calls, the seasoning packs didn't make it here, but our objective is to have a healthy, affordable, convenient package. You guys, all you have to do is throw that, grab, you have three pounds of meat, a roast. This is a stir fry, but I, okay, I got a pit, wrong picture. But you get, grab the roast, you grab the veggie, put the seasoning pack over, wrap it, price per pound. You can feed eight people for under 20 bucks. In let me give you a contrast. I went. When we're working on this program, I went and bought a, a mill, uh, one of the box mills. We all have them, so I'm not, I'm not slamming it. And that's if that's what the customer wants, let's go with it. This is another option. I feel a better option. I went and bought the thing, 20 bucks. Took it home. Took me 45 minutes to cook it. I had four pots and pans. My wife was in the other room. I said, "You need to try this." She came and took one bite. I ate the rest, the whole thing. Now, I'm a skinny guy, but I can eat better than any of you. <laughs> and so it's a myth to think big people eat a lot. You know, I eat more than any of you. But I ate, the, like I say, but I wasn't, I wasn't stuffed. Yeah, I wanted to pr prove a point that I could just eat the thing. But it, it was, uh, it, I was comfortable. I wasn't stuffed. But my point is, tw this is under eight bucks, eight, uh, under 20 bucks, and you can feed eight people. And there's no, we've developed it with, uh, our produce supplier to have a bag come in. There's no labor. You can you can uh, take the if it doesn't sell, uh, you know if you ahead of it and you have to rewrap them or whatever. The produce the produce can go to the uh, service deli and the roast can be reworked. The packet can be reused. There's no shrink on this program. Uh, we get, we want to we want to do more with this program. So let us know how it goes. Like I say, today breaks with one group. Then we, in, uh, next week it breaks with the, I think, uh, the next group. And then we got both groups. And then I wanted to do a fajita. And we're working with, uh, and Tom's going to talk to this too. We're trying to get more seasonings and stuff. Next slide. This is part of the program. This feeds four. Chef prepared. Next. Tom's going to talk to us about Ready Chef Go. It feeds two. It's just that segment of society that wants that convenient. We're giving you an option. We're giving you a program. It's a destination. People will love this program. You get behind it. You, like I say, you get, we're salesmen. We've got to make this happen. People want it. Okay. This program uh, is a Brent at Ocean Beauty. We've done a lot of work with him. He's supported us a whole lot. Let, and let me just make sure I hit some of these things. Uh, Surimi, the number one surimi in, uh, in the nation. Transocean, you guys need to be on it, especially for the holidays. It's snack ready to go. Fresh product, Fresh product in the house through Ocean, Ocean Beauty. Uh, we're getting ready for the holidays. Echo Falls, everybody needs it. We're going to talk about the, the skin pack, though. So uh, 
what did I, uh, oh, a couple of other things. The vendors, like I say, we have great vendor support. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is the vendors have put deals online. So the vendors aren't here, but they're supporting us 100%. They're sending us deals all the time. This uh, Chilean rock crab claw, 570 a pound, great bunker holiday item. Uh, okay, got the Echo Falls. Let me just hit this. Okay, all that money that is invested in that Albertson service case, the facility, the labor, the shrink factor, if you added up how much you have to, the overhead you have in that case, it's, it's crazy. We've taken all that away and given you a skin-packed program. We worked hard to bring this to market. It has application for the, more for the small rural stores to be in the seafood business. So it's a high-end product to begin with. To be part of this 40 knots, a sustainable cop program, you have to, we have to hit certain specs. It's high-end fish. It's not the other service case with the lower end product from other countries. This is high-end product in the latest, greatest packaging that breathes. So the vision of this program is to hold it in the freezer in a service case so it's visible, but it's not to be sold out of there. Yeah, have it there and people want to grab it, they go camping with it. There's all kinds of applications. It only lasts six months there. It's not a hard cryovac type package. Reason being, because if you slack that out, there's botulism. So what we want to do, that's got to be a breathable package. So that comes from the freezer to the fresh case for seven days. So you have six months, seven days. You're in the business with a high-end product. There is, the back-end monies on this is nothing. We're trying to get it out to the stores. Uh, it has application in, uh, in the city, too. It's quality product. Uh, I just can't say enough about it. Other, and there's going to be TPRs put on it. I'm trying to get it in the ad so, like, say, the rural community can be in, 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 the, in business. Uh, and I guess, next slide. So, uh, like I say, super fan mentality, next slide. The takeaway from, uh, the takeaway today from my presentation and from the team is innovative brands has turned the chore of grocery shopping into a totally unique and pleasant experience for the consumer. And the consumer is going out and being evangelist for us. That is the takeaway of today. Remember, if nothing else, remember that. Uh, the team at Associated Foods, we have a fiduciary response obligation to serve you, the members at Associated Foods. We take that responsibility very serious. Like I say, we're here for you. Call your retail specialist. We need to get these brands out there. So like I say, so you guys can have that super fan mentality be the brand your department, be the destination, and develop those customers that will, like say, have that cult following like Trader Joe. Okay, any questions for me? Any uh, come in? Okay, we're good. On store link. On store link. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there should be a link on store link. Uh, they, uh, I thought they were even there already, but uh, I was going to go look. But anyway, they will be there. The deals, I've seen them come in. Uh, we've communicated it all, so yeah. And like I say, thanks again to our vendor community. They gave us so much support. Uh, so Marty, I'm going to hand off to Marty. You want the pointer? Or? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Which one's the, the uh, laser? The laser is that one. That one? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Zan. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know some of you have traveled a pretty good uh, distance this morning and maybe even some last night. Uh, great to have you with us here. So we're going to talk a little bit about market conditions before we get into the real fun part with some cutting and so on. But just wanted to let you guys know kind of what's happening out in the industry and why maybe you see prices where they're at. Uh, and just give you a broader view, a quick broader view of what's happening out there. So first of all, the beef market. Market ready cattle are plentiful, a lot of them out there right now. Um, 
Packer margins are extremely strong. What does that mean? That means they're going to continue to push as much cattle through there as they can because they're making money right now, right? Okay, so we have a lot of cattle out there. The Packers incentivized right now to pull that product through. So we should have a lot of cattle or a lot of beef available to us. In the short term, the choice grade percentage has strengthened a little bit and will continue to grow long term. Uh, it has been on an upward. Sorry. Yeah, I pulled it over. Yeah. Okay. So long term, the choice grade has been going up. And in fact, the select grade is shrinking. The choice and the prime grades are both, the grade is just going up. Cattle are getting better and better. The guys have understood now that that's what the consumer is demanding. And so that's what the producers are producing. They continue to use better genetics to get higher quality cattle. Um, one thing that's happened short term here that's changed uh, availability a little bit, Tyson plant fire. Any of you hear about that? Their biggest plant back in Kansas, Garden City I think it is, uh, had a fire early August and that plant is shut down and will be for a few more months. They processed about 30,000 head of cattle a week, fed cattle that come into our beef supply out of about a, approximately 540,000 cattle per week that are harvested, fed cattle. Immediately prices jumped overnight and that happened with Tyson first but then the rest of the packers followed suit. Okay? They really jacked them up for a little bit there. We've started to see cattle back up because of that, right? People responded and said, you know what, I can't run that on ad at that price. Started to back up cattle. Price is starting to come down. We've seen it in the last probably week and a half, two weeks, where it's plummeting, actually. Um, and so that's, that's good news for us. We can get back to running some good hot ads, hopefully. But seasonality is going to come on again. We start going into Christmas. What happens? Prices go up on our ribeyes. New York's, so on. Okay. Okay, we need to get this crown roast in the oven, so we're just going to take a second to show that to you. If anybody wants to uh, take a look up close and personal, you'll have to see it after it gets cooked. But uh, that is a beautiful roast that is going to be in demand, like Zan said, at Christmas time. Take advantage of it. There's margin in it, and people will pay the money for it at that time of year. These guys are going to show you how to cut one if, if you don't know how, and, and uh, there's several different ways to do it. I think the way they're doing it is pretty valuable. Okay, are we back on PowerPoint? Okay. So uh, we will be using uh, suspended... Well, let me go back to this. So they will be uh, coming back around... I think they said a couple more months. So hopefully we'll continue with that good supply. We'll be using suspended fresh again this year. We found, uh, you know, there were a few issues last year. Some of the packages did not have bone guard in them, and so we had some leakers. It wasn't a huge percentage, but it was more than what we'd like to see. We talked with Cargill and, uh, and, and suspended fresh talked with them. We ended up going with Cargill again this year just because their pricing was better than the others. They have a great quality product. Hopefully they understand that we need that issue fixed and we'll have bone guard and not have the leaker issues. Next slide. Just so you can see here, if you look up there, that green line is 2014 and that is uh, pricing for uh, cutout on cattle. You know what the cutout is? That's a uh, average of all the pieces that they pull off a beef steer or heifer and what the price ends up being. So if you look at that, back in uh, 2014, it was pretty high. Do you know what happened there? You remember the drought? Okay, so people got rid of their cattle. All of a sudden now uh, there aren't as many cattle out there. Prices go up. What I want you to see here is how 2019 now is jumping up. It's outside of the ordinary, isn't it? You look at the difference there. Way outside of the ordinary. Why is that? Look at the time frame that that happened. 
What did we say happened in the beef industry at that time? Fire. The fire. Okay, so prices went up. You can see it's starting to come down now. We think it'll do that again and get back to more of a uh, trend, which is the 14 to 18, this trend right here, the black line. Okay, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about pork. Have all of you heard about the African swine fever? Okay, that started in China. It has spread very quickly across the rest of the Pacific Rim countries. It's also in some countries in Europe. Um, there's no cure for it. What they have to do is try and stop the spread. And it spread uh, through the air. It spread through uh, the pork product. If, if, uh, pork, if other uh, hogs eat pork product in their meal, that can be uh, spreading that. And so they're trying to work on that, um, but it's been devastating in China. About 30%, they've had to uh, cull out about 30% more than what the entire U.S. harvest or supply is in a year. It's incredible, and it's going up. This number was from a little while ago, so it's gotten worse than that. We don't have it here in North America yet, and we pray that doesn't happen. Um, we've got, I know that the uh, FDA is working hard to put in some measures to protect us against that, and they're watching the ports very heavily. Um, hopefully that doesn't get here. <clears throat> China's begun, finally, to up their U.S. pork imports. What's happening out there in the country right now? Have you heard about the tariffs? Okay, so heavy tariffs on U.S. pork going into uh, China, and it's been a battle. They have not bought pork from us for so, quite a while, but now they're running out of their frozen supplies, and so they're having to start do so, doing so. And we'll show you on the next graph what that looks like. So they've now started to import some U.S. pork. What's that going to do to our pricing? It's going to push it up a little bit, isn't it? Okay. It's price supportive, so all other proteins start to float up, and we'll see that on this next graph, too. Um, U.S. pork production is up 3% year-to-date and should remain so for the rest of the year. Let's jump to that next slide. Here's what I'm talking about. So, see China, we said it happened in August. They stayed, it was a little bit before that time, and it stayed down for a little bit. Now they're having to dive into their supplies. So, it actually, I'm sorry, it happened back here near the first of the year, but they continued, it, it jumped right at first, spiked up because of all the hysteria, and then they started using all their frozen pork and it went down, and now this is China live hog price. So their prices have gone up considerably, and it really is a world market that's gonna affect us. Next slide. Market conditions on chicken. There's been an overabundance of chicken. Have you guys ever seen, I mean, it's been a while since we've seen as low a pricing on bulk boneless, skinless chicken breasts, right? It varies a little bit seasonally, but there's a lot of chicken out there. Um, mainly the, there's been an overabundance mainly in the large market, that's the commodity bulk chicken. However, that African swine fever is beginning to prop up all those other proteins, including chicken. Um, so that'll stay up for a while, although with that abundance, right now, boneless, skinless chicken breast bulks about 108 to the stores out of the warehouse. Crazy. Take advantage of that. Turkey. Turkey's going to be a little higher this year. For years now, the turkey industry has really been hurting. Those producers have not made any money. And uh, so this year, they, they cut back on their pulse. They, they destroyed some egg sets. and. Uh, that's about what the price looks like it's going to be into the stores this year. So it's up about 12 cents a pound. Uh, the, end, the good news on that side is what? You don't have to sell as many birds to hit the same dollars, right? So sometime we look at inflation as, man, that's just bad. It actually makes it easier for us to hit our sales goals in some respects. You have to find that balance between being able to run it at a hot ad price and will you sell more product or can I make as much money selling fewer? Uh, I think we've talked about that. Yep, 
Okay, let's next slide. So this shows you the chicken market, 2014 again, kind of followed that same pattern. All boats float higher. Every protein affects what the other is uh, doing as far as costs. Let's jump to the next one. Market conditions. Uh, seafood continues to be high. Demand is growing and I don't know that supply is keeping up. Sometimes we hear about those endangered species out there. There's still a lot of farm uh, raised product out there. But demand is strong. If you're not using a seafood program, uh, Zan had a really great success story with Benedict's where uh, they went in with Ocean Beauty and set their case with a lot of products that they didn't think they could sell or had never sold. It was a beautiful set. They sent me some pictures of it right off the bat and that has been extremely successful for them. They've continued to sell those items that they started out with. So take a little bit of risk. Invest in yourself, in your future sales, and in bringing some more customers into your store because if you don't have that product to offer, they're not coming to your store and that means you miss all those other sales, right? Let's jump to the next. I think Zan covered the, uh, the programs very well. Um, I know we've had some struggles with Mound Air, with uh, product being shorted, trucking issues. They're coming clear across the country. I can tell you that we're taking a very hard look at that right now. Um, don't want to be premature with anything, but we're taking a very, very hard look at where we're at. And we have been for several years. We just haven't been able to find a program that we thought would uh, replace that and be better. Because we love the product. We love the packaging think it's tight and uh, doesn't leak and the product doesn't purge as much as some brands do. We want to try and find how, either fix that problem or let's find a program that works better for us and that we're not struggling through the winters in particular. Um, don't have much to say on the rest of these. I think Zan covered it very well. If you want to jump to the next slide. New items. I think Zan touched on most of these but the shrimp skewers, if you haven't used these get some of these in. They come in IQF. Um, they're priced very reasonably where you can do uh, surf and turf. So if you sell those out of your butcher block or even if you're selling them wrapped, do some suggestive selling out there. When you're selling a steak out of that block or even out front and somebody's looking for a steak, do some suggestive selling and let's, let's plus up your sales, plus up your profits. They're really good and they look good. Um, I think that's about it on that. Next slide. Any questions? Okay. Well then, next slide. Let's cut some meat. Uh, I think that's what uh, everybody loves the best in these. Every year we kind of find that is the case. We've got Steve and Jordan back there that are going to walk through some of these uh, grill cuts. And Zan talked about this a little bit, but I want you to understand that, yes, ribeyes, New York's, you know, those items are always going to be high here. It's just the way it is. But what we can do is offset that with some medium tier opportunities. And uh, I think we've got some labels back here. We dropped some into you guys' uh, uh, bags. So take a hard look at this program and if you have questions get with your meat specialist. Um, these will grill very well and it's a mid-tier like Zan said $6.99 to $8.99 probably on your price points and you can be in business with that product. So with that let's jump over. Okay so the first thing we're going to start with is the check. Um, we demoed this several years ago at the meat seminar, but we continue to push it because it is a high quality item and, and an item that's new. Not a lot of stores are doing. Uh, most stores are already pulling the, some of the chuck guys and do really well with that. Um, but first thing, just like always, you clean up all your bone skin on all the dry part on, of, off the chuck. And then I 
I always take the, the bone skin off this side. Okay, and then this little lifter piece right here. Now I always clean this up try to use it for either cube steaks or stew meat, but always try to utilize that stuff instead of throwing it into your trim. I won't process that any further, but that's what that little piece looks like when you get it all leaned out. So the rest of this, I get the good large chunks of fat off of it. Okay. So once you get there, depending on how you want to approach this, so what we're doing today is we're going to just cut the whole thing into steaks and just get a couple roasts off of it. Uh, it used to be that I just do ch a few chuck eyes off the front, but what we really want to show today is that you can actually seam it out and get some more chuck eyes and then also the Denver steaks. So the part that makes the chuck eye, now this is the only piece of meat that I actually know the, the proper names of. The, this muscle right here group is called the longissimus dorsi. And you just find the seam right here along the side, and you're basically going to just roll this piece right out. Okay, now what's really fun is I left, I went on the wrong seam. So the, there is typically when you do it, there's this little piece and you can either go either way, but this, this little piece right here, if you pull it off, it looks like a flank steak. I'll set that aside for a second. We'll clean that up. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> so, so now that I got this piece cleaned up, the long isthmus dorsi, I can cut chuck eyes uh, farther down and, and go and just tell you start to see it, the muscle can, uh, change. Here, I'll do that piece in a minute. Okay. So these are your chuck eyes, and basically it, this muscle is, is the muscle that runs all the way from the head of the animal down to the butt. And so these are your poor man rib eyes right here. Um, most of you guys already know that and promote those really well. Um, and we're going to take, oh, let's see, probably go to about right there. So that way I can pull a few more chuck eyes to merchandise. This other piece, as it starts to change, find the end of my string. We're just going to tie it and, and make it into roasts. Now keep in mind when you're cutting the chuck, this here you can, if you're going to make a one pot mill, or uh, you can cut this to fit that as you're going along. And that goes with Ready Chef Go too, is you're cutting stuff, just set it aside so you're prepared to make your Ready Chef Go's and stuff like that. So it kind of all comes together. Okay, and then 
there and I got two small rolls. And I say typically this other piece will stay on there. Um, I just got into the wrong seam as I went around. It came off a little easier than it usually does. Um, but once you get that long estimus dorsi off of there, you just take and start following the next seam down, pull the fat off the top. You'll find this next seam, which ends up pulling this piece off. Um, and when, once you clean it up, this will look like a really big flat uh, flank steak. This is called the splenius, but when you put it out in your case, you can call it a Sierra cut. seeing them on the broadcast at the yeah. same time we'll just skip those. everything we're talking about is just if you have you have them in your packets or just be right here so if you have new people in your store you want to just show them they're right here so and, and all the program books are available on store link um, on the meat page you can find program books so this is that Sierra cup uh, you can take it you can package it like that in a 10 s you can take it roll it put it in a 2d um, that people would cook that really similar to a flank steak. Okay, so now we're down to the last part. This is called the serratus ventralis. That's why I had Jordan do this because I can't pronounce his name. Well, th th this is the only cut of beef that I know the names <laughs> on. So I'm just going to clean it up. There is actually one more little piece that we got to take off of this. When you, when you take the fat out of here, you'll see that there's a muscle on to the side here that's called the rhombodius. It makes the hump of the, on the neck of the animal. So I'm just going to come in here, take this piece off up on the side. That's really only good for like stew meat. It is a nice lean piece, but it is, is a tougher piece. I'm going to just finish cleaning this off. If you have questions, feel free to jump right in. We'll try to answer them. Okay. Once this is all cleaned off, you'll, you'll see that the muscle grain runs two different directions in here. Um, when I've watched and, and learned that some guys just like to take up one big long cut, but then you end up cutting with the grain on here. Um, what I started doing is splitting it about right here. Um, that way I can do stakes across the grain down this side and I can turn this piece and do it the other way. As I cut these, these are your Denver stakes. This is the piece that very few people are, are promoting or, or utilizing. But in a shear test, these are actually the fourth most tender piece of muscle there is in the cow. And so it, it's one of the most tender pieces, but we don't promote it as a steak. Um, and if you just cut them and put them out there and call them Denver's, very few people are going to buy them because they, they don't know how good they are. It's going to take some promoting and building and talking to your customers, just like they talked about earlier with CAB. One person at a time, you, you educate them on what it is, let them go cook them, see how fabulous they are, they'll start buying them. But you got to do that with all your, all your customers. It's kind of like the Chuck guy. You can't, when I started cutting meat, I introduced the Chuck Eye, and then everyone wants to come by the Chuck Eye, and they just love them. So, these other pieces, because they are so much longer than the, the front half of it, I'll typically cut them in half so it makes all my steaks a little more uniform um, when I'm packaging them. Um, but you can see how tender that muscle is. You can almost take, just take it and rip it right in half. I mean, that, that is some tender, tender meat right there. And, and that's how you do the chuck eye 
the Denver Steaks Sierra Cut. Um, by cutting it this way, you can actually increase your margin on this one item by 5% when I've done cutting tests on it by promoting them as a steak versus as a roast. Uh, it does increase your, your trim a little bit, but the, the prices you get in steaks offsets that and it increases your margin. So. Okay, there's that. Any questions? Yeah, what's your congested retail price? So, um, I like with the CAB stuff, I've been pushing them about $6.99 or $7.99 a pound. Um, kind of that mid range uh, steak. Uh, it depends on where you have your ranch steaks and bottom rounds as well. So, you're a little bit higher than that, but below your New Yorks and ribeyes. So. Uh, it kind of depends on your market and where. How about the roast that you're trying here? So the roast, I, I haven't promoted that as a Chuck I roast. I, I think I just can, uh, have been utilizing that as a Chuck roast deal, so I just keep it priced as that. Um, I don't think at this point I'd focus more on promoting and educating them on the steaks and getting more there than trying to get an extra 50 cents on the roast side of it because uh, it's not that big a piece. So, okay. uh, any, any other questions on that? Shoulder clawed. How many times do we have them on to add and we just whack, 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 we cut them into rolls, we stick them onto the wrapper and wrap them and stick them on the way? But I did all the time because you want to get production done. But let's just say you're doing an ad, you have your clawed, take one clawed out of that box, you trim it up, or even if you're just making ground beef out of it, take some time and the flat iron right here, second most tender steak on the cow. I think a lot of us are missing that boat on uh, promoting that. Anyway, so you want to take off the silver right here, just trim it off. Jordan, you dulled my knife, but that's okay. It's dull to start with. I know. But the one thing is, make sure you pass on this stuff to your, your people, you know, your apprentices and the people that you talk to them and let them know how important it is that we upsell people and try to get a different um, flavor in people's mouths because it's kind of cool. So anyway, you can kind of see the seam. I don't know if you can, you probably all know, but right down through here, you can just take your knife and follow that seam to get that flat iron off. And now we're heading into winter. You know, you want to take off all the bone skin, of course. I mean, if you set some of these aside for your, your night guys or whatever and just kind of have them learn how to do this. If you have vacuum, you know, if you have a vacuum, these are great. Put a little seasoning on them. Put them out in your case of seasoned meats. And these are really, really good. You can put them in there and then people can take them camping because they hold up pretty good in that vacuum seal. You want to take off all this. And you know, I'll tell a story. We got these, we have these, um, we have these labels we put in all your bags. Tell a story, put that light, the sticker on it so people say, hey, we can take that home and grill it. It's going to be good, you know? Kind of tell the story what it's all about. Make a section on it and just promote it, especially uh, heading into fall with the campers going out. So we got that trimmed up. A lot of people I see when the chuck rolls or the, the claws are on cross ribs, they'll tie that, they'll stick it out in their case as a, as a roast. Anyway, I, would, I take that off a little bit. And then now we're heading into fall, you can take this, and I know this isn't part of a grill cup, but if you take a couple of those, bone with short ribs, put them in your tray, and that sinew right in there, it was just turning into gel when you slow cook it, and it's, it's really actually pretty cool. So then you just take your knife. I know you all know how to do this, but... Just like filleting a fish, which I'm really good at. Some people will leave these steaks whole. Some people like to cut them into... Um, into three to um, 
a serving size for somebody. I personally like to cut them into a, you know, a serving size steak. So I cut that. And that, look at the marble in that. It's gonna eat up good. Put that on the grill, it won't take too long to cook. Give your wife the one that's skinny because she usually likes them well done. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful dill. Okay, so now we want to get to the heart, okay? So we want to get the muscle, we just kind of pull apart. We want to get to do the ranch steaks. And you got some muscle in here, you got the sharp fin and different things. You can do cube steaks, stew meat, all that stuff. Cube steaks is something that I think a lot of people miss the boat on too. Basically though, I think cutting meat is a pretty, it's a pretty cool deal. I think we all have these skills and I think we can even take it to the next level, you know? And then you, some people like to leave the fat on. Some people take it off. I prefer to take it off. It might, might get stuck on your lens. It'll be cool. Get an action shot on that. Okay. So we call this a heart of the shoulder. That's where we're going to get our ranch steaks. Always take off a little bit. You always, you know, you cut a, um, against the grain. Always do that in the stew meat cube steaks. And the, the thing that I think, too, that was is cool about it is you got to go thin. You know, I think a lot of people don't do thin cuts. When you do a thin cut, you want to do, I always mark them up 30 cents more a pound. Because when you do the thins, you're getting a little bit more out of your, you know, because it takes a little bit more time. And you can put those in the 8S. I think they look sharpened in 8S. I think I forgot to take off that one, but that's okay. A lot of times when we cut meat, we get in the habit of cutting it all the same thickness, you know? I always like variety. And then you always can cut a roast, you know? And there's your roast. I always take a little bit of that off. And you got a nice cube steak. Cube steak, stew, stew meat, you can even make stir fry out of because it's going to be so tender. But have fun with it, you know. Tell people what you got going on and enjoy. Steve, maybe share with them that you can also seat those two muscles out, the root and claw. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to see that out. That's where you get the ranch steak. I kind of got ahead of myself, so. Well, they, didn't, they didn't hear me, so. Just yeah, can you repeat? Yeah, there's a seam that you want to seam down. That's where you get that steak. I forgot to cut that down because my mind is going kind of fast. But take that out, and that's where you get the ranch steak. So that was my fault. All right, so now, same thing. Top sirloins, they go on ad how often? Maybe once a month? Maybe? How often do we just cut them again and just put them out? So you want to take your knife, take off all the back here. So we want to take out the mouse. I have been told that this mouse will turn the top sirloin. You know how sometimes top sirloins took dark really quick? If you take this out, it's supposed to keep the red, it's supposed to keep it redder. So that's I take it out. And you just follow the seam. And you take off the cap. And what we're creating here is we're gonna call this a baseball steak. Think about it, we're heading into fall. We got the you know playoffs coming up, World Series. Why not put this up front? Baseball stakes, make a little baseball theme, have some fun with it. 
So when you're taking off the cap, you just, you know how to take it off, you just pull it apart, it comes off pretty slick. That's the cap right there. Some people, I mean, I, you can make stir fry out of it, you can make steaks. Um, you can roast it whole, yeah. So uh, then you take off the fat here. Anybody have any questions? What's the subprimal name of the cat? What's that? What's the subprimal name of the cat? Repeat it. You gotta repeat the question. What is it? What's the question? I didn't hear it. The subprimal the name of the cat. The yeah. Sorry. I'm a little bit like You're in the zone. I'm in the zone. So anyway, you can take off that. That's pretty leaned up. Okay, now when you get to this point, there's a seam that runs right down through here. You want to take your knife and you just want to separate it. And just take your time. Once you get doing these a few times, it's, it's, it goes by pretty quick. And some people tie this when they do their rolls, but I usually don't. You want to cut your steaks a little bit thick. And then I like to put a piece of bacon around some of them. That kind of gives it that nice. Everyone loves bacon. Okay. And I'll tell you the trick too. I think a lot of times we, when we're packaging up our steaks and whatnot, we're, I think a lot of time we're selling a lot of tray. I think we fill the tray and make it look full, you know. So once we get to that point, then we got the rest of the top sirloin here. And if you wanted to cut some more, you could cut down here and make some more if, you, if they're selling well, or you can just cut it into top sirloin. I always take that off, that first piece is always kind of weird. And these, you know, I think these make great, they fit the tray nice in your family pack. And then don't be afraid, like I said, to make those thins. See how nice those look when they're thin? You can put them in a tray. You know, and sometimes too, if you think that top sewing is just a little bit too big right here, you can cut it in half. Look how nice, I mean, you don't need to put bacon around every one of them, but bacon is like, I don't know, I think bacon's the best thing in the world on anything, so I like it, but you want to kind of mix it up. Fill the tray, you can put these in seven S's, make a nice play of those and mark it up and have some fun with it. Put the grill sticker on it and you're good to go. Any questions? Well, want into steaks, okay. You want to take off that silver. Some people, like I said, I like to leave a little fat on this just because it kind of tells the story. We even have some, we got some vacuum pack somewhere. Those are the vacuum packs you're talking about. You have some that, um, some stores have a little peg you can put them on. And you, I mean, you think about taking those camping. They don't, they, water won't get into them. They won't bleed everywhere. It's kind of a good deal to, if you have that chance to get that. And you just want to take off some of that fat. Some people pre-trim the fat. 
All depends on what you want to do. But use those pro program books that we have and just have them sitting there because obviously I missed a couple of things. So if you have it sitting there right in front of you and you're not like feeling stressed out, you have it right there, it's good to go. And just tell your people when you're cutting an ad item, you want to upsell. Build around the ad. Build around your ad item to make some money. And two, also, I think eventually a lot of these big stores are going to be going to their pre-packed meat. I think we have a good opportunity as a company to have cutters in-house and be able to take care of them, like, like doing this stuff that they don't do. And uh, so I think we really need to get that out there and um, let them know the story. Questions? You guys are awesome, thanks. <laughs> Where are we taking these? So now we're going to go pork. So we got Travis and Brent coming up. What's he taking? We got to give him this. Just grab your mic. Let me, get, let me get out your stuff. Where's oh, sorry. Oh, my gosh. <coughs> uh, can I borrow yours? Thank you. Jordan, your name, Batch. Whichever one we want to do. So we've done some prefabrication on the pork because obviously we don't have everything we need here today to show you how to make the uh, rack of pork roast and the crown roast. So uh, we've, we've prefabricated some stuff. We're going to go ahead and do a pork leg the old fashioned way. So uh, Travis is going to do the rack of pork and the crowns. All right, so we've touched a little bit about these pork loins. Um, and with a lot of the competitors and things that we talk about, this different stores that may be going 
full-on prepackaged pork. Um, we thought it's a new way, or uh, we wanted to introduce, reintroduce these, this pork loin. Um, so what we did here is we pulled the center cut out, we took the rib end, the bone end, sirloin end, and it was a little harder for us to do, so that's why we did, of course, we'd have a saw, none of that in here. So, um, so we're going to make a rack of pork. And the first thing we did was... it looks was like this one we've already done. So we pulled yeah. the membrane off. Yeah, the first thing we did was pull the backbone off where the backbone sticks out and clean that up. And you're going to find that these backbones stick out far enough. You're going to have to clean them pretty deep and uh, to, to get these marks in there to get the pin bones out at the end. So this one, as Travis was saying, the membrane's been taken off just like a peeled back rib so that you've got the quality of product in the end because this is a premium holiday roast and you want it done the exact right way. These are really tricky to get off. I need a better knife. Try that. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Okay. That's your knife. Okay. So usually when we're doing this, I know a lot of guys don't cut, wear cutting gloves. I find that it's a little easier just for the simple fact that I can grab that membrane and peel it off. What's that? With a cutting glove. See, sometimes it's tough to get it started, but if you get it right, yeah. where'd you put my knives? Well, I didn't do anything with them. Oh, it'll come off in one sheet. If you're careful, you start ripping on it, it won't come off that way. And also see, we cut a whole case of these and we found that each loin, some were easier, some were harder, some had more of it, some did not. See, as you can tell, once you get that off, it's just easy, easier for the consumer when they get home to work with it. Because it does make it a little chewy. So then from that step, we're going to French the pork loins. So okay. Frenching is the process of pulling off the excess meat behind the eye. That's right. So we start, we leave the eye intact. We don't want to gouge into that at all. And we just cut clear to the bone. Cut that off. Okay, so once that good and clean, that was that first one. It's kind of a pain. In. The other thing we have done on these pork loins is you take the center cut of the rib off. As you get to the blade end, you know that bone gets longer and rises. So you can see on both of these that we've trimmed these uh, back ribs so that they're even all the way across and both of them are going to come out the same height. We also pre-trim that as well. We try to get that down because sometimes they're thick, sometimes they're not. We just get to our eighth of an inch trim. So that nice center cut, that's our rack of pork. We provided these funny little tassels. Bring the tail and potatoes. <laughs> uh, they're there in the next room. But you have some nice kale and tomatoes on the pictures you'll see in the PowerPoint. See, some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. And this box here is kind of an older one too, so they kind of stick together. And this is just for show. I mean, they just look nice. <clears throat> 
I know Jordan was mentioned. He mentioned earlier that uh, Kevin will make some for you. <laughs> oh, that's right. He'll teach you how. Anyway, so you see how they go. Now the crown roast is. Zan said earlier the pork loins right now are in the low dollar range. Even if they raise in the holiday seasons, you're still going to be able to get a premium price out of that rack roast. And uh, these are the things that set you apart as a retailer. The big advantage we have, just like our hamburger programs where we believe in fresh hamburger, the corporate stores, the Smiths and those guys, the Walmarts of the world, they're doing prepackaged pork. So we have a serious advantage of putting out a higher quality product, making more money, more margin on it, and bringing people into your store. So this is why we really wanted to show this. I mean, if you're looking at the stores in um, resort areas, I have a store that we do these, uh, quite a few of them in the holidays, and they're $18.99 a pound. Now you're not gonna get anywhere near that, but you should get a premium price for this and put something out that you're proud of. Also, while we're doing this, you know, we are pulling merchandising things out. You're gonna see Thomas do some stuffed pork chops later on. Uh, these are called scatter packs. Uh, Steve brought it up that we used to do great with these, so we'll just put some thicker cut pork chops in there, put a premium price on them, and just scatter them down the meat case, and um, it really raises your growth up total gross on doing Cut them that. nice so, and thick, inch and a half. So now the tricky part, Travis is gonna turn these into a crown roast. And this nine, there's nine ribs on each one. Eight. Eight. I can't count. So, I mean, uh, this is really the smallest crown roast we think you can do. Uh, like I said, in the resort area, we do a lot of threes. I've done fours. They're hard to package. Well, Sorry, Brent. Go ahead. What I've always said is anything less than 16 ribs on a crown is a rack of pork. Yeah. So, I mean, you can do it. It's just a little harder to do. They're real hard to tie. So I was just done a nice center cut, eight rib on each side. And like Brent touched too, we just cracked the bone on this side. Because after it's cooked, it's just easier for the consumer to use. They can cut in between the rib and have a serving size. So. Um, so there's a few different ways that we've tied these babies. We actually took yesterday and ran wherever that ended up. We're not going to use it just yet. Yeah. We ran it through the center of it. And to me, that was pretty slick because we were able to stand it up. When the, you trim one properly, right. you lose a lot of the support. You do. So sometimes you have to do that one string kind of through the middle that holds it together and then you can grab the two end ribs and pull them together. So the way you tie it, um, I think Travis is just going to tie the ribs well, today, but it really depends on how sturdy that crown is after you make it. And another concern that I had too is if we were to do that, the customer might not know the string is on the inside, and we don't want that to end up in their food. So just a thought. Let's tie these together, Brent. See, there's not much of a bone right here. Yeah, and that that's when you've got to grab a lot of meat. You know, they're cleaned up so that you get the showing of the individual chops in there. Uh, just for aesthetic value, you've got to make sure that you don't go too short on your string because it'll pull right through the meat. Grab that. You try to go up over the bone. That's perfect.
Let's see. So I don't know if you can see it from that angle, but going through here, Travis actually took the first two bones into the tie just so that he's got enough product in there to hold together. See, a lot of places don't do these. But like Brent said, I used to have, no matter what store I worked in, I used to have people asking about these and then the lady come back every year because she knew we'd take care of her. I think a lot of brought this back is doing holiday open houses and we're putting fancier cuts and stuff out. And we learned the people want these. There's a demand for them. That's it. You can put tassels on there just the same way. Uh, stuffing, there's a lot of different uh, stuffing options. Rodon Foods will talk about that when he gets up here. Packaging, tell them how, we, how you package that, what you used to do with them. Well, so there's probably a lot of different ways of doing this. Uh, of course, we're going to put this in the tray for now. But again, what I've always done in the stores is we'll take like one of the clear cake lids flip that thing upside down and put like a soaker at the bottom and just stick that in there and wrap the top. To me it worked out great because I mean you're able to get the top tight and it didn't poke through and then they can still see the sides. So it's pretty cool. And depending on your opinion for a bigger one you can use the bottom, the black bottom of the tray and put soakers and that around it and then wrap it that way. Just your opinion of what looks best when you present that. Any questions? Nope. Okay. We'll move on. So getting back to underutilized pieces of meat. The pork leg is a perfect example of something that we don't use a lot of. Uh, there was a point in my career where I had some supervision have me bring them in. And I did think I wasn't going to be successful with it, and I was dead wrong. I mean, I sold nine cases in a week in a very good sized store. Uh, and what we'd like to show you today is the extra merchandising that you can get out of them. And most people don't do these anymore. This is going to be interesting. So if you're watching this later online, there is a PowerPoint presentation on how to break them, and we did it on the saw. Yep. Thanks, man. But the way you start with a pork leg, the bone going from, from the sirloin end to the shank end this way, you want to hit this bone straight. So that's what sets your angle. If you get off angle when you're breaking it on the saw, then you're going to have a large bone in there. It's going to come off angle on you this way. So this is the H bone, or the hip bone, the end of it here. And I just put two fingers in there, and I take the saw and break it right off there. Chances are, the saw we got from the guys down in the meat room could be better than the saw we used on the pork loins yesterday. Yeah, just grab the other side of that. Paulson, we need you. <laughs> Hold it down. <laughs> So, um, obviously we wouldn't recommend using a handsaw, but you can. I wouldn't try to bone this end out because of that H bone. If you've ever boned one out before, it's hard to get out. It's a little on the dangerous side. And this is better just to sell as a fresh butt half roast. So, on this end, we're going to take it apart. So, right here would be your sirloin tip if you're pulling it off of beef. 
we can take that off right there. And then when I start doing this, before I pull off the uh, butt end ham, I'm going to take a couple of slices of shanks off here and sell fresh hawks in my case. But we're just going to bone it today. How's your arm feel? Sore, but I'm old. <laughs> So that would not be the way that we would recommend to do it. But now you've got your basic round. So here's your top round. And this is a little warm, so it might be take a little bit more to skin it off. We turn it into a denuded round so it pulls the inside cap. And cleans it up pretty good. And while he does that, I wanted to show you guys as well. Center cut pork steak. We pulled out of the center of that. Obviously we did that yesterday with the saw. But. So I will let Travis cut this inside round and show you the quality of that. And the whole key to, I think, any pork program pork is ha hawks. having a good sausage program. This is going to set you aside from anybody else. The sausage sec uh, program is key to doing that. And you should, I wouldn't say you're going to lose a gram because we are in a shrink business, but you should never lose a pound of pork trim if you've got a good uh, sausage program. So as Travis does that, I'm going to pull a little more sausage out. And as the cutters that have been around a while would recognize, I'm going to turn this into a gooseneck. And the gooseneck in the round, in the beef, is just leaving the bottom round and the eye of the round together so you get a nice piece of meat. If you're going to do a lot of stir fry or sukiyaki meat or something like that, you can definitely peel this completely out and do that. Uh, what you'll see in the uh, PowerPoint presentation is we use the orange jet netter after we clean this all up and we put it through that small jet netter and it makes a beautiful roast. We'll probably just hand tie this one today. Plenty of stir frying stuff out of that. Sure. Okay. Show that off. That's a nice one. Now, on the fresh pork leg roast, shank or butt half, we'll leave the skin on. Obviously, on the further merchandising cuts, we're going to remove all the skin and put a nice lean trim on the pieces of meat that we're going to sell for boneless pork leg rows.
obviously that little jet netter not only looks better, it's extremely faster than I am. Oh yeah, you know, forget definitely. that. Yeah. Just took the pork skin and just rolled it up. I don't mm. like throwing anything away. Have it too deep or something to put that in. Yeah, we do not. Which way you want to go? We've got that sirloin tip here we can take apart. We can make more pork cube steaks. Stew meat might be a little, well, the quality of the top round for stir fry is way above this, so I wouldn't use it for that. Carnitas, you can label it however you'd like. Get it too. Yeah. Of course, mine are small, huh? That'll work. What you got there? So I didn't talk to Noel today about the cost of these, but I have some stores that have actually looked at buying uh, combos of them, um, and the quote on those was in the low 80s at the time. Like I say, right now, we're in the period of time where the packers are buying legs to make hams out of, so we're probably in the highest area. Um, you know, when you're in the spring, uh, early in the, or late in the, a uh, year, probably about November, they stopped making hams really in the in the ham price. You could see it, well, we have in the passing in the 50 cent bracket. So uh, it looks like a lot of labor, a lot of work, but these are the things that nobody's utilizing. And we think you can set yourself apart by having this out there. And obviously at those cost factors, you can make a lot of money on legs. Brent? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what Marty just mentioned for people online is that they're taking a look at buying boneless parts uh, of a pork leg. Uh, the chef here at the Institute actually showed us a pork ball tip yesterday that came from a further merchandising packer. We'd never seen one before. Looked really good on the grill. Yeah. It ate great. So um, that's even where the food industry is going. But if we can buy them boneless, and uh, you know you can save yourself a lot of labor and still make as much money because of the price value of these things. So anybody got any more questions or? Inexpensive and you can further merchandise it. Okay, thanks. And the more you do, the quicker it gets, the easier it gets, so. Most of them probably quicker than us anyway. Oh yeah. Thank you. What do you wanna do with this stuff? <coughs> I just put it in. Let those That's guys make crap. sausage out of it, yeah. You go and clean your board up. Yes. 
You give me half a second. I have to run to the bathroom. You're fine. You're fine. So we're on hold for a minute. If you guys want to run out and hit the pad, now would be a good time to do it. Or grab a donut. There's coffee in the back, juice. You guys want to drink? No. We're, you know, I can stuff it if it's cut. I've got... I've got you want to cut that pork chop and we'll just do a stuffed one and then will you cut that salmon out of that package vanna vanna thank you vanna no i think we're good no we're waiting for her to come back from the restroom i don't have a mic thank you Brent. Yeah, I'm on mute right now. I've got one. Courtney, where the other mic went to? Zan's looking for it. I am. Oh. Thomas needs one. Uh, Thomas has one. Yeah, Thomas. I have got I've got the, the green, green, green one. Orange. Yeah, if you would. However you want to do it. Huh? However you want to do it, man. So I'm just going to use the other pork chop in the Ready Chef Go. Yeah. No, it should be on now. Yeah, yours is good. All right, Steve, uh, make sure you put yours off of you because you're going to talk. Thomas, you grab yours off of you. Okay. Ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm Thomas Brown with the Mancini Road On Group. Um, we do most of the programs with associated foods as far as the one, one pot meals, the Ready Chef goes and the chef prepared meals in your bags. You'll have a copy of these to take back to your stores so that you can utilize them at the stores. There's also a sheet in the bag that covers uh, all of the warehouse, what the warehouse carries as far as Everson Spice, the packets that we use in the meals um, are also on that list so you'll be able to order them. So whether you do the chef prepared or the one pot meals, they are in there. And if you have any questions on, on any of this stuff that we're going to show you, just come up and ask Steve or I, and we'll be happy to explain in further detail. Uh, right now, we're just going to do the chef prepare, the ready chef go meals. These bags are special bags that are built for cooking a meal in the bag itself. Uh, they're microwavable. They're also ovenable up to 400 degrees. So that's just something that you need to explain to your customer. Most of the time, most customers are taking this to home and microwaving whatever the product is. There's cooking instructions on the back of the bag. So depending on the protein and the weight inside the bag, it will tell them how, how long to cook the product in the bag. Um, and it's really simple. 
Typically, we try to stay within three steps to make it easy for you guys uh, routine-wise. And if you've got other people in your shop working at the butcher block person or something, it's just easy for them to, to do. So today, we're just taking one of the skin-packed 40-knot uh, fish, the, the salmon portions. These are excellent because they're already portioned to the size that we need them. Uh, basically, you're putting the protein in the bag. Make sure you put the, the protein too up towards the front so you can see it. A lot of times people will put the vegetables in front of the protein and it hides it. So keep we, those, the protein up front. Do you have a spoon? Um, i get one. If not, we can just use my hands. Just use your hand, I don't see one okay. back here. Yep. The bags you can just order. Yeah, the bags are in the in the warehouse. Uh, again, on those sheets we have the item numbers for all of this. And then your night person, when they're there at night, just have them grab a, a bag. Of this they'll you know put the water in it, just sit in your cooler. So when you come in the morning, either you or your butcher block. Can hurry up and make it happen. Get it ready for the lunch, people. It has. It should sit for how long in the water? The uh, overnight's good, uh, but typically you can you can utilize it within an hour or two. But again, if it sits overnight, it's 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 better that way. It's fully hydrated and ready to cook. Now all we've done is seasoned the fish added the, in this particular case, the rice. There's four rices available. The other way that you can do these meals is with vegetables, either the pre-cut vegetables that are coming in from the warehouse, or you can be cutting your own vegetables, fresh vegetables, to put into the meals. Um, and if you uh, use asparagus, make sure you break it, and don't put the little crappy end in the bag, because that will be, that's a, they won't buy it if they have that in there so make it look look good and have it eat good typically with fish i would put a, a lemon wedge or slice in with the fish and we typically use asparagus we didn't have any available today uh, again rice or vegetables or um, that's the best way to do it we've seen a lot of increase in fresh fish sales with the ready chef go program um, the consumer sees the bag realizes that they don't have to touch the fish. They can take it home, cook it. So the mom that doesn't want to handle fish can take that and have it as her meal while the rest of the family has something else. So essentially, once you get the product in the bag, there is a line going across the bag, a red line right here. That's where you crease the bag first. And then you take the uh, paper adhesive cover off and then seal the bag itself. And that's ready to go. When they put it in the microwave, these bags are self-venting, so they'll puff up like a popcorn bag. Steam will produce and then it'll start venting as so it can cook the product with the steam. So, and it's, it's, a very, it's a very good program, and like I said, it's a good way for you guys to have a meal out there for somebody who's looking for a lunch or, or a dinner to take home. Yeah, for lunch, took, put it up for the service deli if you, if you have a little killing or whatever. Yeah. Put it up there right next to the microwave, say just a quick meal, you know, pretty cheap, good nice. protein. Has everybody tried them? Has everybody, you tried one, Greg? Yeah, they're pretty good, I was surprised. Yeah, and you'll see on the recipe ideas with, with all of these meals that are set up in the programs, there's many different seasonings you can use with each of the individual proteins, so you have a good variety available to the consumer. That's what I'm saying, like when you're cutting your pork chops, you only need to set a couple aside to get these Ready Chef Goes to go. 
And yeah. if, if you prepare for it, it's easy. You have to go back and get a primal. You have to cut it. You're going to create more work for yourself. So just kind of plan ahead. This is a regular pork chop. It's actually a little bit thicker than what we would normally use. Uh, I would recommend a thin cut pork chop uh, just for the cook times. And as you can see, the bag is getting a little tight. Do we have the garbage back there? My do. Okay. You hand it to me. I got you. And one of the things that we typically do when we're doing this is we would typically take these and have a whole bunch set out. And so we would fill all the bags and then fold them over, then take our gloves off and pull the tape because the, the sticky part will get on your gloves. And then you would get a whole tray done much quicker that way. Instead of doing one at a time, trying to go through each protein, have the bags lined out, have the vegetables or the rice in the bags, and then just put the protein in them, shake them up a little bit, seal them, and then scale them and put them out. So it's not, it's not as complicated as we want to think it is. It is actually pretty quick. And your sales, I mean. What's the shelf life you put on them? Three days. Three no days. more than what your, your typical protein would be. You're still selling it, but most of the time it, it won't be out there that long. And this is like, it's another good out too. So if you mass produce a little bit too much, you want it to be fresh, but you can always have an out for a quick big lunch tray. special. What do you need? The big tray. Right here. So right now we're going to go to, that's one program that's already set up. And like I said, we've got all the item numbers. Uh, like Zan touched on in when he was talking, the one pot meal we've been working with Associated Foods for quite a while to try to get this going. I think we've got it dialed in now. Uh, again, this is in your bag so that when you get back to your shops, you can look this over and start ordering what you need and start utilizing it now. Like Zan said, they've got it on the ad uh, starting this week, today. today. And then there'll be a follow-on ad with the other ad group next week. And this will be something in the ad rotation as we go. Essentially, all we're doing is taking the vegetable bag that's coming in pre-portioned placing it on the tray. We're taking the roast, over wrapping the roast, and then, oop. Thank you. Thank you. Placing that on the tray, and then over wrapping the whole, whole thing with the seasoning pack. Now there's 20, 20 seasoning packs in each one of the boxes that come in. They're built for the crock pot or Instapot. They will make a gravy when they're placed in the Instapot. So not only do you get the meal, but you do get some the gravy out of, out of the seasoning. Uh, we just slide it in there. There you go. Take the whole thing. I wrapped oh, it. Yeah, he, Steve wrapped it. Uh, take the whole thing and then tray it up, wrap it, tag it, and put it out in your meal section. Uh, like the presentation Zan had where we had the chef prepared the one pot meals and the ready chef go so you start building the destination for your customers they'll know they can go to that section and they'll get that type of meal you know you, give sir. us some feedback too on if it's working or if there's something okay. we can do a little bit different with it so give us some feedback and let us know how it works and there's a new four foot schematic out on store link uh, for for these meals so if you want to see how you want want to set it up in your meat case? There, there's a new one out there. Um, where did I put that? This one's, this one's really easy. Heading into fall stuffing, all that kind of stuff. And I always think the pork chops are an easy way to stuff. So you kind of want to put a smaller. I always put a smaller pocket into the pork chop like that, and then I. I you can either put your finger in and rub it to open up, or you can get your knife and dig it around. But if you just do a little opening, it's, I think it's a little bit easier to yeah. it present. It holds together better when you wrap it. And again, this is a great use of a bone-in product. 
I mean, it's typically cheaper than, than your boneless product, and you can get more profit yeah. well, just, out yeah. of it. Yeah, and if you have a butcher block, you do a nice little pan of it. If, it have, if you don't, just place it in your meat case. Put, you can put a couple of those 7S trays, scatter pack is what I call them, and you'll be amazed of how people would just pick them up because they don't have to go home and touch the pork. They can put it right in the, yeah. in the oven. And that goes, with, that goes along with all the rest of the value-added products. I mean, just as, as these guys have mentioned before, as you're working with whatever protein you're working with, if you're training up chicken drums and thighs, set a couple of trays aside, grab some of the topicals, the lemon pepper or the Mr. Pig or whatever it happens to be that you have available, and season those trays up. And then, like Steve said, scatter them across your case. You'll start noticing that those will be the first ones that are gone because the consumer sees that as, oh, it's already done for me. All I have to do is take it home and cook it. So doing this stuff, and it, and it can be that easy. One or two trays every time you're working with something. You know, just a couple of stuffed pork chops as opposed to, you know, 15 trays of them. Just one or two. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that the consumer that the consumer gets to uh, your store, finds it one day, and the next day they or the next time they walk in the store, they don't they don't necessarily see it there. Um, it becomes the Costco experience as far as hunting, you know, finding a product one day and not the next. When they do see it the next time, they'll pick it up because they want to have it. They tried it, they liked it, they want to have it. They'll come back and ask you for a product if you have it out on the case, or you had it out on the case and you don't now. And that communication with your customers is awesome. You guys interacting with those consumers and talking to them is the best thing in the world. They, they, that's the one thing that they want more of. Um, the only thing that we've got left is this is the actual chef prepared meals these are the the meals here in these trays the trays that we use in the program are ovenable so the consumer would take it home and then place it in the oven take the lid off obviously place it in the oven and cook the meal that way as opposed to the one pot or the instapot that we're doing with these and these these are sized to feed four where these are a six to eight meal uh, container. Uh, so basically all we're doing is taking the tray, our vegetables, that are blue. And one thing about the Ready Chef Go is me and Thomas do a lot of traveling together and this we go into these stores and the manager says these there. aren't going to work. and. Uh, so we hurry up and do a, just a few. We don't do a lot, we do a few. And the next day we come back in, or they call us on the road, and they say, we want to keep doing those because it worked. So it's always good to give it a, a fair shake, give it a try at least two or three times, and just be consistent with it so that they can get it. So basically you're still taking the same vegetables that you're using in the one pot meal. You're putting it in the tray with the seasoning pack and then adding the vegetables around the roast. And then you'll also see with these chef prepared meals that there is a teaspoon of crushed garlic um, added and also uh, a, a dollop of garlic butter. That's just to help in the cooking process and the seasoning process. But again, you're basically getting a meal similar to this. And again, this is feeding fewer people than the one pot meal is, but there are, there are accounts out there that are going for this type of look in their case. Uh, and if it works, that's great. So that would be perfect for me and my wife yeah. to take home and cook it. Yeah, because we want to we wanna range be able to feed, you know, the chef, the ready chef goes, your one or two people, the, your chef prepared four, two to four, and your one pot meals, the family size meal. Does anybody have any questions on anything that we've talked about while we were up here? Is there any? 
uh, retails. Um, we've got it set up so that, and you'll see on the paperwork that we can do a fixed price or a random weight price uh, on the on the items. Uh, typically, it's whatever the protein is plus, you know, yeah. What well, with the one pot meals, what we're really shooting for is to get it under that twenty dollar price point. Something like this, you're going to be ten. $12. Um, with the Ready Chef Go stuff, basically whatever the protein is, plus a little bit more, you know, 25 cents, just like the value added product that we do in the stores, you want to raise that price just a little bit more, uh, get a little bit more money out of it. Because that's, that's one of the things that we really like about the value added programs. Something as simple as sprinkling, sprinkling some Mr. Pig on the, some dry, drums and thighs and charging an extra 25 cents per pound. That's increasing your guys' margin with very little work on your part. And that's the same here. You're offering something that the consumer is looking for and are really looking to get, and you become that destination. Therefore, they're shopping your store more. They're, getting, they're buying other things in the store. So that helps the store all together, but it also helps your department. Uh, any other questions? Does Interscale have CLE funding? Does, yes. Yeah, it's in the, the oh, sorry. Does Interscale is it, PC. has the PLUs? Yes, they do. They've all been set up. And like Zan was mentioning earlier, this is a developing program. We will have more recipes and more ideas coming down the road so that we can promote them and we can keep changing it up. One of the things that we've learned is we got to give the consumer more variety as we go. But we felt that these, these core items that you see in the, the book are a good start, a good basis to go off of, and then we'll just build from there. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, yeah. So. Sticker for cooking instructions to go with them. On the inner, on yeah, on it should Jordan isn't it set up on the? It's in inner scale, but I think you have to change your label format to make sure. Yeah, that's one of the challenges because not every every scale is the same across all of the stores. So we can put it in inner scale with the cooking instructions on it, but sometimes the format doesn't support. That. Hey, oh, one, yeah. One yeah. other quick note is, if you spread the word through your store, like tell your checkers, you know, if you checked out the one pot mill, it's a great thing for the weekend. You, you get them excited about it, and so because they're the last people who are going to talk to that guest, and they might not know about it. So if you give them a little bit of like a little love and say, hey, let's talk this up. I think you'll even see it work a little bit better for you in your stores. Absolutely. Uh, the last thing that we're going to cover, uh, Smithfield and the Mancini Rodon Group, we're doing the manager's contest on fresh pork again. We've done these in the past. It's, again, most stores get confused about how these works. You're basically competing against yourself. What your sales were last year this time during the period of the promotion. So if you have the largest increase in sales yourself overall, uh, one of the things that we're really looking for in, during this contest is pictures and how you've set up secondary displays, bringing attention to the pork itself and um, how you're displaying it to the customers. Uh, the pictures make a big, big deal. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the guys that have won in the past have won based on the pictures that they've sent in and the effort that they've put out. Uh, more than, you know, yes, they've had the increase in sales, but going out there and putting out that effort to uh, promote the product makes a big difference in the contest. Um, if you guys have any questions, again, there's, you know, a $500 gift card for the, and each group, again, you're competing against yourself, but you're not competing small store against big stores. 
they're broken up we've broken up all the stores in groups so there's multiple groups to win there's a $500 gift card for the grand prize winner there's five runners up that get a hundred dollar gift cards and then we're also going to uh, overall grand prize winner there's a trip for two to the Pennzoil 400 NASCAR race so Smithfield will flip the tab to take you and somebody else to the NASCAR the Pennzoil 400 so that, that's pretty good, and and a lot of the time, and these guys, the meat ops guys, will will attest to this. The guys that put out just a little bit of effort, put out a little bit more pork, set set up that secondary display, on during these contests. Those are the guys that win. I mean, you, it's 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 amazing how easy this can be, and they're and they're just blown away that. You know, we're walking in there and handing them a $500 gift card for the little amount of effort that they put out. And again, you're not competing with the store down the road that does five times the business. You're competing against yourself. What you did last year at this time during the contest. So it's very easy to get in the running. But again, I'll emphasize the pitchers are going to play a big portion of this. Um, any questions on... The pork contest, it'll run through October 1st through the 31st. So if you do have the secondary displays, let's start thinking about that now and how you can utilize those for this contest. Any questions on the Ready Chef Go, the one pots or the chef prepared meals? Okay, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you guys coming out and everybody online for watching. Oh, yeah.
so I can use your purple one. Sounds good. And do you know where the stakes are? Did someone go find? Oh, okay, okay. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Hi, everybody. How are you? It's good to see the front of your faces instead of the back of your heads. So my name is Laura Hagen. Um, I am a chef with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I run our culinary team. So part of what we do is um, manage all of our recipe development. So anything that we're doing with beef, whether it's a new cut, an opportunity cut, um, a new cooking method, all of that runs through my department and we go through a testing process and then that gets published on our website, Beef It's What's For Dinner. You guys have probably heard Beef It's What's For Dinner .com. That's basically the brand and our programming. Um, but I do work for the Cattlemen's Association. So that's just one of our programs that promotes beef to um, consumers, our supply chain, as well as um, our influencer audiences. Um, basically what I'm going to do today is just chat with you a little bit about um, some of what you're going to eat for lunch, but also just looking at those steaks that were fabricated and really just talking a little bit about how to prep those, maybe how to sell those a little bit in the um, meat case when it comes to um, sending people to your spice aisle or to um, your herb aisle um, so that they can actually uh, be successful in getting those roasts or those steaks um, ready to go before they start cooking them. Um, my able-bodied assistant here is Jacob Schmidt. <laughs> yes, hello, I'm with the Utah Beef Council. Uh, I'm not a chef, I'm, I do their promotion and marketing here in Salt Lake City, so if you need anything from the Salt Lake office, materials, information, that type of thing, I'm, I'm your guy. So. Perfect. And I'm going to attempt to operate this. Yep, just don't let them get too smoky. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, and uh, some of the gentlemen already kind of spoke to the sheer force and the tenderness of beef cuts, is we did a while back, um, we do a lot of um, kind of uh, basically tenderness profiling, muscle profiling and tenderness studies. So there's a slip of paper um, on the back um, when you exit if you're interested and it just gives the muscles that you know basically are from the tenderness or most tender to, um, to least tender. And we brought up the um, Denver steak, of course tenderloin's number one, the flat iron's number two. Um, there's also some muscles on here that are just bigger that don't contain just a single cut. So um, they're still tender but they don't necessarily have a call out. Ribeye cap is another one that rates really high up there. It's number three. And then we've got the tri-tip and the sirloin tip center in kind of that top ten um, group. So personally when I'm you know going to be grilling something I want it to be pretty tender. Um, the ranch steak that we cut is not necessarily the most tender cut so you kind of have to play around with those types of cuts. You want to tell people that maybe this isn't the one that you're just going to throw on the grill. Maybe this is one that you're going to actually put a nice rub on and keep in the fridge for a little longer so maybe that salt kind of penetrates a little bit. Or maybe you're also going to tell them to marinate it. Throw it in marinade, put it in you know, a few hours to overnight, and then they'll just get a better eating experience. It's really about getting people to recognize what cuts are going to work the best for them and how they plan to cook. If they're planning on grilling, then shooting them you know, in the area where they're going to be successful with cuts. The flat iron especially is one of those cuts now that has really, really exploded. It was a study back, I don't know now, 17 years ago, 15, something like that, uh, before my time at the Beef Association. But when it was determined that that top blade could be turned into more of a fillet, and they got this second most tender muscle, it became this steak that's really something that's very, very cool to offer to people as a cut that's beyond those middle meats, beyond the standard ribeye or the strip steak. Um, so we like to kind of push that in, um, woohoo, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of that, but, <laughs> but holy moly. Um, Check Denver's, there's a roast. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, so I like to look at it as that you're really asking somebody, what are they interested in cooking? Who are they serving it to? How much do they need? And getting them to go in one direction or another so that they'll be successful. And one of those things is just preparing steaks. So we're gonna actually go through and probably do a little bit of flat iron. We're gonna do a little bit of Denver. Denver steak, super, super cool. These guys were talking about it. It's a perfect portion. Now, do you want so, to season these? Or are we um, yep, I'm just gonna put them down here for a second. Right, I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm using you as my assistant. Could you just put that down there yeah. for me? I'm not telling you what to do. Um, <laughs> Chuck eye steak. Those are a little oh. thick. Let's, let's maybe go with this tray, it's a little bit thinner. Chuck eye steak, steak is fantastic. I put our little carcass map over there, but you know, that chuck eye is right next to the rib. So as they were saying when they were fabricating, I mean, why wouldn't you try to sell that? for a little bit um, more reasonable price. You see a lot of them when prices go up, you see a lot of those more in the restaurants because restaurants recognize that, hey, I can sell this and still get the exact same quality um, as a ribeye, but it's a lot cheaper for me and my food cost. Um, I don't think we'll do the Sierra because the Sierra really requires probably a little marination. Think of it as a flank steak, similar to a flank steak. Uh, let me see what else can we grab in here. Yeah, I think we've, we've got four Denver's there. I think we can probably go with those. Do you want to do, yeah, let's do the, we can do the top sirloin. Yeah, just a couple of those. Perfect. Um, let's do the ranch. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, that's probably going to, th these are all going to be sampled right at lunchtime. So we're going to get them cooked off and then we'll sample them. Um, you guys can sample them when you're having lunch. So if we're looking at steaks and we're preparing them and we're giving people advice on what to select, once they've gotten that far, it's also telling them how to season them, how to get them ready for the grill, and even that cooking process. Sometimes people just need to have some guidance. So they can go to, um, obviously, the meat manager, and they can talk to the meat manager and get some advice in that area. But um, there's also a lot of stuff they'll read online that's not necessarily going to give them the best experience. So I think the more it can come from you guys at the store level and really explaining to them how you know, this Denver steak can work really well on a grill. Um, it doesn't require marination. It's something you can literally pick up, season, put on the grill, and be done with in probably under 10 minutes. So those types of tips and those, that type of information is really key for them not only buying the steak, but feeling confident that they have an idea of what to do with it once they get home. Um, so let's do Denver steak here. What I like about this mostly, back about 10 years ago when I started the association, we were doing a lot of chuck roll. And so these were being cut constantly, and everybody was like, well, what are these? Well, look at the marbling here. I mean, they're, they're amazing. They're small. They um, are really super easy to cook up. They're very, very tender, as was said, the fourth most tender. And um, I like to just simply put salt and pepper. Yeah. We're going to do the roast. I'm going to. I'm going to get these going because I'm concerned about time, if that's okay. Okay. Um, we're not cooking the roast, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk about those. Um, with, this, with doing salt and pepper, I don't like to do it too far in advance because just as I mentioned that you can get a little salt in them, kind of a dry brine, um, you don't want to do it too far ahead because it, it can leach out a little bit of that um, liquid and you don't necessarily want to dry them out, but you can do it a little bit in advance. So again, salt and pepper, always a little bit higher um, level with salt, even though you might think that it looks like too much, you'd be surprised. And then I like to do a simple pepper. The other thing, a little bit of garlic. This is just a roasted garlic. What I like to tell people who work in the stores is that you guys, obviously, why don't you go ahead and cook those up? Um, I'd be happy to. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, we didn't really we <laughs> plan this. I live in Colorado. He lives in Utah. We just saw each other this morning, so we're going to do our best we can so that you guys will learn from us. Um, when you are seasoning, though, it's, it's important that you put enough on there. Um, I add usually garlic powder, salt and pepper, and that's all I do. I mean, that's pretty much all I do for most everything. Um, we're going to grab the thing that you can think of is, as um, being in the store is that you guys have a whole spice aisle, right? I mean, there's a spice aisle. Spices aren't limited to garlic powder, salt and pepper, obviously. There are so many different individual spices, and it, that aisle has just grown as international flavors have gotten a lot bigger. So now you'll see shawarma, you'll see harissa, you'll see these really 
unusual spices that maybe you haven't heard of before, but they're putting those in the stores because people are now having that kind of seasoning at restaurants, they're seeing it on TV. Um, but I always recommend just a mix, you know, a Montreal steak seasoning, perfect for any steak you're gonna cook. Um, a Greek blend that might be perfect for another steak opportunity you're gonna have with a Greek salad or something like that. So recommending some of those blends where they can buy one bottle for you know three ninety nine instead of having to buy six different types of spices and put those in their um, spice cabinet. So I like to think of that as being kind of a good way to get them excited about seasoning their steaks, but they don't have to make a super big investment in them. Okay, these are our sirloin, looks like. They always say season from on high. Have you seen that? And who knows Salt Bay? You guys have heard of Salt Bay? Anyone? Anyone? Yep. Yeah, okay. She. <laughs> So surprised. <laughs> um, Salt Bay is just this interesting gentleman on uh, the internet who likes to season here and lets it go off his elbow. Um, but he's got a whole brand now and probably a YouTube channel, so you never know what people are willing to watch. Um, those can go ahead and be popped in. Let's get some of the Chuck eyes going. Now we also want to talk about roast, and I'll pull. Do I have the actual? I guess I have the roast here, right? Yep. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about two different cooking methods. So you can't just take a roast and just say, I'm going to put it in the oven and roast it. I mean, you can, but you're not necessarily going to get the result that you're looking for from every type of roast. So that's why we have a dry heat cooking method and we have a moist heat cooking method. Drying is roasting or grilling. The wet cooking method is braising or now slow cooking or pressure cooking. Um, the Instant Pot was mentioned. That's huge right now. People will probably come in and talk to you guys and say, I have a new Instant Pot, what can I cook in it? It's massive. The, I think for the last three years, it's been the top selling item, cooking item on like Amazon. So imagine the numbers of pressure cookers that are out there and the number of people who don't know what they're doing with them <laughs> because it's usually about half. Um, so we do a lot of education in that area and really talk to people about pulling the right cuts for that. So I'm gonna grab a chuck roast, which what would we do with the chuck roast? We would probably dry or moist cook. Anyone? Right, moist? That's kind of your classic pot roast. Um, I often tell people too to actually take um, pot roast and think of it as, you know, there is an opportunity to further fabricate it a little bit at home. So not from the chuck roll down to all the cuts that the guys did earlier, but certainly down to stew meat, down to smaller pieces if they want to use a pressure cooker and do something in under 30 minutes. Um, that's an opportunity there that they can take advantage of. There you go, sir. How you doing? Oh, I think we're doing good. Excellent. Great. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, okay. Let's look at the roast because I know we're, I'm between you and lunch and that's always the like, it's a really nice time to be talking to people about food, but it's always like the glaze over starts to happen because you're hungry and so just stick with me for a little longer. So just as a gentleman we're adding, um, if you guys know much about cooking, there's carrots, there's celery and onions in here. That is your standard, what they call mirepoix, which is the standard, um, it's basically one part, or, I'm sorry, two part onions to one part celery to one part carrot. That is what you put as a base for almost every soup you make and every stew you make. So just keep that in mind. If you're gu guiding someone who's just bought a chuck pot roast and they don't have this, certainly if you do have this, lean them in that direction. But if they don't have this, send them to produce and say get a, head, get a um, stock of celery, get some onions, get some carrots, or even the frozen food section. I will often take frozen uh, vegetables and put those in the bottom of a pressure cooker or a slow cooker, put my pot roast in, I won't use those vegetables because they break down too much because they're small, but I might even actually puree them into my sauce and have it be a nice, thick, really unctuous kind of vegetable sauce. But of course, with a slow cooker, with braising in a pan, this is how I would do probably a braise in a pan. Um, don't really need the rack. Sometimes people will put racks in, but usually your vegetables serve as your rack. So all these beautiful vegetables go down, pyros goes up on top. I usually season it with salt and pepper. Um, you can sear it on the stovetop in advance if you want to get a little bit harder crust. Um, that's an opportunity, especially when you're slow cooking, which is going to be a lot of condensation and steam. 
So getting that sear, sometimes what I'll do is just put a little bit of flour on each side, sear it in a pan, get it nice so I like that, that uh, beef kind of caramelization, or they call the Maillard reaction, which is basically just that taste you get from caramelizing beef, from searing it. That's why it's so yummy. Um, and then I would put it in my bed of vegetables. I would add some liquid. You only have to add liquid up to about two-thirds of the um, height of your beef. And then I do plastic wrap, foil, and put it in the oven. So that's as simple as it can be for someone at home. It's even more simple, excuse me, that pepper's going right up my throat. It could be even more simple if they're using a slow cooker or a pressure cooker because they don't even have to worry about monitoring it. They can program it. They can get um, this pot roast cooked and probably, I think we decided kind of ultimate in the pressure cooker was about 70 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, something like that is really cool to be able to tell somebody that they can, they can manage that in that period of time. So, again, salt, pepper, uh, probably a good idea. <laughs> it's that pepper. I'm like, whoo. Thank you. So super, super simple. How many of you guys cook from, oh, go ahead. Most guests, when they cook a pot roast or an oven roast, they put it in overnight. And to try to get somebody to not do that is almost impossible. Yep. Like, like, oh, that's going to be tough. I need to cook it all night. So, so gentleman here is asking about, you know, how do we get people away from trying to cook something overnight? That's a hard thing. Number one, I don't want my oven on overnight. I don't need to have like one thing happen and then I'm woken with the smoke alarm going and my cat's freaking out. Um, so I would never recommend in a, in a house keeping something like that overnight unless it's a slow cooker that's been monitored and keeps a, maintains a very, very simple temperature or very low temperature and it's electric and I'm not worried about other things. Um, I think it's just letting them know that there's also an opportunity, if they're gonna do this pot roast and they wanna present a whole pot roast, I understand that, but when you're putting something in a slow cooker, cut it down into a couple pieces. Bring, you know, the, the smaller the pieces, right, the less time it's gonna take. I'd also really encourage people to, to get on that pressure cooker bandwagon. I mean, I have one at home and I use it all the time, constantly. Um, it's just one of those types of um, appliances that it's gotten so good that you don't even have to worry about it anymore. I mean, my grandma had one. I think we made root beer one time. All the root beer bottles exploded in the basement. I don't want to have that happen in my kitchen, right? I don't want a pressure cooker that explodes. But they are so good now. And I would really highly recommend, you guys probably sell them in your store. Um, I'd highly recommend getting people into that place and not being afraid of it. Being able to push one button with maybe a slight time adjustment and being able to leave it alone. And when it's done, it even it'll auto pressurize if you want it to taking that lid off and you got beautiful pot rows so it's kind of changing a little bit of that habit like I don't need to be cooking it for 12 hours it's okay to cook it for 10 hours in a slow cooker it's okay to cook it for 70 to 90 minutes in, in a pressure cooker um, yeah frankly it's just not what I'd recommend I'm surprised many people do that most people are so paranoid about having an oven on overnight or I am <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we have this roast, and then I think we had a sirloin roast in here. Yeah, this is. I don't. Well, we can we can just talk to it. So um, on the other side of that, if you're not doing a standard chuck roast. Oh, in the fridge. So if we're dry roasting, this is this is your wet roast. This is what they call braising. It's what they call slow cooking pressure cooking, it's cooking with liquid, it is taking a, a less tender cut, which is the chuck, and bringing that you know, low and slow to make sure that you tenderize it, making sure that it can be either sliceable or shreddable with the amount of time that you use it. One of the things I would like to mention though about pot roast in general, most people think of pot roast as pot roast. It's like what you have on Sunday. It's what you make for the family for a special occasion, maybe on a Sunday after church. People don't think of it as shredded beef. And it's so fantastic as shredded beef. And that's a really great way to sell it. You might not want to have pot roast and slice it with gravy and have a heavy meal, but you cook this long enough, you've got shredded meat, and all of a sudden you can add barbecue sauce and it can be a sandwich. Um, I actually made um, some pork Sunday, 
And my husband's been eating as a sandwich all week at work. Wow. <coughs> okay, this is a, a tip on presentations. Do not use a lot of prepper, pepper. <laughs> well, my eyes are burning, too. Um, but anyway. Um, all this smoke. Yeah, well, that's, that's this carcinogen, whatever. Um, I am not. I am not. No, it's just when as I start talking, it starts getting like, um, where was I? Um, oh, about shredded beef. But if people don't think about it. They really don't. And that's one of the things that in the beef industry we've talked a lot about is like, how do we look at kind of that deli area where the rotisserie chicken is sold and get beef into that area? How do we do that? You know, and in, in my opinion, doing something where it's more like a shredded beef type of thing rather than a whole pot roast that you'd have to um, cook from start to finish for a long period of time. Um, doing something where shredded beef is available where you can season it however you want. You can add barbecue sauce, any type of style of barbecue sauce. You can, um, you know, move it and put it into anything from hash to, um, to other preparations. You can throw it on top of a salad. There's all different ways that you can use that. So I do like to mention to people if they're interested in pot roast to think about it too as shredded beef and not just as that Sunday roast because that's a, a big deal. Now, if you're dry roasting, usually, and these are hotel pans, these are not something you guys have at home, and most people would not have this at home, so they might have a jelly roll pan, something like this, and oftentimes they have a broil pan that came with their oven. Um, that is probably the easiest thing to tell them to use. It's usually still sitting there in the, what's called the warming drawer of the oven that nobody uses because they don't know it exists. Um, but usually the broiler pan is down there. I like to put foil on the bottom Make it super, super easy. Give them those little tips that are super, super simple. Um, foil on the bottom. Usually the broiler pan, or in this case, this is a jelly roll pan or a sheet pan and a rack. Uh, and put the, uh, the roast on top of here. What you want to avoid is not too much sugar in a roast. So don't send somebody in the direction of like coating their roast in brown sugar. I mean, it's just dumb. It's just going to burn before the interior of the roast gets cooked. So. I would recommend, like I said, a blend, a salt and pepper, simple, simple, simple. You don't need to put it in a pan and sear it. It's going to brown because of the dry heat. So that's different than obviously browning it and then putting it into a liquid of some sort for the braising or pressure cooking method. But that's as simple as it is. It, the Beef Association, we do have some cooking instructions that just talk about temperatures. We often lean on the side of more like simple, like really, really lower temperatures than trying to get people to put raging hot, you know, items into raging hot ovens or in raging hot pans. It's just not good. They tend to burn things. They tend to smoke out their kitchen, their kitchen, excuse me. And um, so what I always recommend is, man, keep them at 350, medium in an oven. So easy to monitor. Recommend thermometers. Thermometers are a great way to not ruin a roast, especially those that are um, suitable for an oven putting that thermometer probe into, um, into the center of the roast, being able to kind of stream it out, having that outside so that you can monitor it. Everything is so sophisticated nowadays, like these thermometers have things that you can put on your phone and you can monitor your phone and uh, by, by using your phone, they've got alarms that go off as soon as you're getting to the temperature you wanna pull it at. Um, another thing is to really tell them about how when you take beef, whether it's a grilled steak or a pan broiled steak, or a, roast, or a roast out of the oven is let it, uh, let it rest, excuse me. Resting is so important with beef, with proteins in general. Resting is the only opportunity, the opportunity that that meat has the chance to reabsorb its juices. So if you've ever cut into a steak, cut into a roast, and all this ooze comes out, you have the potential of really having a dry product. So just let it rest. With the roast, it could go up anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees. So if I've got a ribeye roast or even a smaller roast that I'm dry roasting, I want to really take that into consideration. So letting people know that resting is important, that you might not pull it at a perfect medium rare or 145, you may be pulling it at like 132 or 135. So once people have a success, they tend to repeat that process. Um, and I've found with consumers that most of them are much more interested in knowing timing than they are in using thermometers. So you can push a thermometer, but sometimes they have to have a success and realize it took them, you know, an hour and a half to cook this roast um, for them to then repeat that success. Um, if someone's had a failure, I still encourage them. 
I think pot roast is the easy way to do beef. It's kind of not, it's kind of hard to screw it up. It's in liquid, it's been seared already, so you've got the flavor, you've got the ability to tenderize it. Dry roasting can be a little harder this holiday season when ribeyes become, you know, something that a lot of people will be buying for the holiday season. Ribeyes can be finicky, they can be tough, they can be expensive. People don't want to screw them up. Um, so as many tips as you can give them, as you feel comfortable giving them, or sending them to a resource at the store who maybe knows more than, than you might know, um, is really important. I mean, that's the biggest questions we get is, how do I know when it's done? What do I do if it's overdone? You know, what do you do when you're ce celebrating a holiday and you walk out and your rib roast is overdone? I mean, it's so disappointing, right? Rib roast is a little more forgiving than some of the others, but that could be a real bummer. So giving them as many tips as you can to give them some success in that area is really, really important. And I always say thermometers. I still, as a chef, always use a thermometer when I'm making a roast. I can't, I can't estimate what the temperature is in the internal, um, at that internal piece of meat at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. How are we, how are we doing? doing? Uh, Good. Are you cooking more? I don't know. I've yeah. Shut these down. How much more do you guys want to cook? Because I know you're just, just going to do some sampling. Okay, chef was going to do that in the back, so we would just need to have someone come up with a knife because I don't have knives here. Okay, well, we take them back. Okay, so what you got so far? I'm Those? Done. Okay. Yeah, we'll continue to cook. We still have opportunity. We still have plenty of stuff. Do you guys have any questions about any of the roasts, any of the beef cuts that you saw? Usually, um, so for resting, um, resting beef, I would usually just tent it. Um, roasts have to sit out usually for about 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes people even do it longer than that, but I don't really want to eat cold beef. I don't want to have to re-therm it, so um, I would tend to just cover it with, with foil loosely so that it's not going to steam, but enough that it's going to keep some of that warmth in the exterior. It'll still be really hot in the interior. Um, you can hold roasts, you know, you can hold them, drop down the temperature of your oven, if you're cooking a roast for Christmas and you don't know um, exactly what time you're going to sit and eat, make sure you finish it and then drop the temperature. You can always hold a roast, keep that in the oven. Um, it's not going to overcook as long as you're not pushing it beyond that level. If you keep it at 350, it's going to go to 350 eventually. But if you drop it down to you know, a safe temperature like 155, 160, then, um, or even lesser, 145, just over 140. We have our safety zone that we try to avoid. So um, between 40 and 140 is just not a good thing for beef to be at that temperature for any length of time. So it's always good to have um, either something holding at a temperature 141 or higher, um, or obviously in the fridge um, under 40 degrees. Um, some of the other recommendations we have with steaks is like I um, season them in advance. You don't have to do that. Um, a lot of times when people are cooking with beef is that they won't season them at all especially when they're doing steaks and they'll season them afterwards just so they can control that. Um, I think steaks benefit from a little bit of seasoning be before you put them um, on the grill, but um, certainly can all be done in the, um, afterwards. Stir fry, that type of meat, anytime you're gonna serve something that's maybe, you're gonna take steaks or fajitas and maybe cut them up and then serve them, certainly I think it's better to season them at the end because then that way you've got all that beef together and you can kind of toss it in some seasoning. Um, including any herbs or anything you might want to add. Herbs are a tough one. People use herbs a lot on roasts, but herbs will burn if you have them in the oven too, at too high a temperature or for too long. So just be really careful if you recommend thyme or some of those, you know, it's the thymes, the rosemary, some of those seasonings that really work well with beef. Um, the hearty seasonings are really, or the hearty herbs are the best, like rosemary um, being very similar to a pine needle. Those types of um, uh, rub or rubs made out of those herbs are a lot better than, um, like I said, don't put the bunch of uh, brown sugar on the outside. Um, there's some of that you can do, but a lot of times people will add just a little bit of brown sugar and then maybe um, glaze it with a little bit of honey or molasses or even um, maple syrup to add a little bit of that sweetness. Uh, you're gonna continue? You 
Yeah, you let's do some of the thin ones just because we yeah. haven't done any of that, and I'd like to do you them. Want to just put them on. Yeah. No seasoning. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just do this without seasoning, and then we'll She's season the chef. afterwards. I'm just doing, I'm just her assistant. I just do what she tells me. Well, the other thing I don't know if you guys noticed is that he he wasn't yanking stuff off of those cast iron pans. Do you guys work, cook with cast iron at all at home? So the big thing that most people don't re uh, realize or recognize when they're cooking on the grill or in a pan. Um, is that proteins release from the pan and they'll have a tendency to take a tong and then rip it from the grill, rip it out of the pan. And so as you see, these pans have been seasoned by the chef here at the school for a really long period of time. So you don't really need to put anything in them. If it's a newer pan, it hasn't, doesn't have a lot of seasoning, maybe a little bit of oil. I sometimes would just rub that in a little bit instead of having oil that could get hot and smoke. Um, cast iron pans get really, really hot, but they have very consistent temperature. So you'll have a tendency to be able to, um, to cook in the whole part of the pan. This is just going to take a matter of probably two to three minutes at the most. So imagine that as like a little steak in the morning or a minute steak for breakfast. Something like that would be really, really cool. Imagine that just being thrown onto a sandwich or a hoagie roll um, with a little bit of sauce. I'd even cut that up and maybe add in some onions and peppers and make a, like a Philly steak. Um, there's a lot of fun things you can do, especially with those cuts that will cook really quickly in the stove. Um, what else? So we did braising, we did dry roasting, we've talked about some of the opportunity cuts that were cut in advance. Who can tell me the most, the question that is the most asked in the store about beef? Whether it's a cut or cooking? Anyone willing to share? Okay. What temperature should it be? What temperature? Doneness? Doneness. Okay. So, in all my years at the Beef Association, that is the number one issue that consumers have. And I mentioned that a little bit before. We try to guide them towards a the thermometer. Um, I did a really interesting um, focus group, set the steak for them. We went back to their apartment or home. They cooked the steak for us, just the way they would normally do it. And then we evaluated it. And I was just there as a person as part of the study. They didn't know I was a chef. They didn't know that I had any real cooking skill. And it was fascinating. Everybody has their own way of determining when something's done. Some of the people who had more experience, of course, did the touch method. You know, hey, is it done yet? You know, pushing down on it. Uh, see, as Jacob demonstrates, it's about like, here's your medium rare, here's your medium. And it gives people some, like a touch point that they can kind of mimic when they're touching a steak. But most people are not gonna have any clue touching the steak if it's done or not. Some steaks are more spongy <laughs> when, they, when you actually touch them. So thermometer number one, um, temperature um, in terms of cooking is you know, something that's not so aggressive. Like I mentioned, don't put it on a grill that's at 450. Put it on a grill that's at like 350. Make sure that a grill also has kind of that um, indirect area so that if your steak is getting, whoa, it's going crazy, you can either put it up on the rack, close it, use it like a lit, you know, I've got a nice thick cut ribeye. I'm going to get that sear going, and then I'm going to close the lid so that I can finish it through without burning the outside. And having that indirect side of a grill, whether it's charcoal or propane, is also super helpful because that enables you to take it away from that hotter heat and let it sit there so that you don't ruin the product. Um, so timing is a really good way of letting people know if they're not willing to use a thermometer is, you know, we've got guides that we have online that are just charts that say, you know, this cut of steak is going to take, you know, eight to ten minutes in a pan going from medium rare to rare, or sorry, medium rare to medium, so that at least they can have some sort of guidance. Um, you'll often see, we do a lot of influencer programming, and you'll often see from a food blogger that they've put a flank steak in and they've cooked it four minutes. I don't know how many of you guys have ever cooked a flank steak. It does not take four minutes. I mean, it probably takes 16 to 20 minutes. Just because it's such an interesting cut in the way that it puffs up, it really has these ends that are going to be very um, easy to finish and get to like 145 or medium rare. But then the center, you're stuck with, you know, trying to deal with that. So people just don't recognize that it takes a little bit of time. But if you're ready for it and if you've marinated it or rubbed it or done whatever you need to do, if it's a less tender cut, Probably the more tender cuts you don't have to worry about as much, but if you kind of monitor that with a thermometer or with your timing, that'll help a lot. Um, but there's, you still can't grill, see what happens. Um, they might have 
I don't know, there's some, they might have a pan that's just rotten and it's not a good pan. The grill might not be at, temp at temperature. Um, there's so many different things with cooking in general that can go wrong. And in this case, you know, and they've always said through culinary school that you're supposed to blame the product or the equipment. That's what they say any chef when you're in culinary school is that it's not your fault, it's the product or the equipment. So that really goes pretty hand in hand with what consumers will do. They'll come into the store and go, you sold me this ribeye and I, it was the wrong cut. I shouldn't have done that. You know, I shouldn't, you should have told me I should have cooked it this way. And oftentimes it's just because they haven't, they haven't followed either instructions that they've heard or they've tried to cook it in a way that's not really good. Do any more or you got enough for sampling? I think we're good. Okay. I know, I know we're getting close to time, so I didn't want to. Uh, if you want to wrap up and then I'll yeah. grab a mic from you and just finish up. Absolutely. So like I mentioned, um, on the back table, there are um, the tender cuts based on the sheer force. There's just a cut chart that we have for retail. And then um, based on the fabrication that these guys did earlier, I found this in my files. But it's kind of a nice little representation of the chuck roll and what cuts come out of there, the shoulder clod. And um, you know, just give you an idea of, and then I think in this one they've got the top sirloin as well. So actually it covered all the ones that you guys fabricated. So just a nice visual that kind of, um, we can make sure that you guys have the file. So if anyone who's watching this um, wants a, a copy of it, they're more than welcome to, um, to distribute it or use it as reference. Um, so those are available to you guys if you'd like them. Um, I'm happy to have been here. I mean, it's really nice to be asked to come out to that. I hope some of what I said was valuable. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years in the Beef Association, and there's just all sorts of weird questions that people are going to ask, and people are still very confused about what they call that sea of red. So I try to, as best as possible, try to identify with them and say, you know, what is your plan? What do you want to make? Sometimes it's easier to ask them, are you making tacos, fajitas? Is it a center of the plate steak? Is it a roast? Is it shredded beef? You know, ask them what do they want to yield? Because oftentimes they don't really know. And they'll be, you know, well, I want to cook a roast. Well, how are you going to serve it? Um, asking them those questions so you can guide them in the right direction into the right cooking method. Because they might have picked up a chuck roast and they want to prepare it for Easter dinner. And you're like, maybe not. Unless you want it to be a braised pot roast that you're going to serve at Easter. Let me guide you to the sirloin roast. Let me guide you to, if you've only got a few people, a tri-tip roast. Guide them to those areas, those roasts that are going to work better for them for the yield that they want. What is, what is their end result? Um, what are they looking for in their goal? So that's what I would kind of end with. You guys are super, super valuable. Because, like I said, consumers don't know a lot. And I think as much as you can engage and talk with people about what they want to um, achieve and if they've had a problem, how you can help them not do it again. Um, that's a big thing. That's how we operate. I get, I'm kind of the butterball hotline at work. So I always get all those really weird phone calls. Like I've had a tenderloin in my freezer for eight years. Is it still okay? You know, and you have to kind of talk people through like, why have you had it for eight years? And do, you know, who has a freezer that can fit that for eight years? You know, and really talk to them about how, you know, if you're making an investment, make sure that you get all the information so that you can cook it properly and really enjoy it and um, not screw it up so that you're, you're, you're happy with the investment you made in the cut. Because beef can be expensive in areas. So anyway, anything else you can think of? I think you guys are going to have lunch shortly. No? OK. Well, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Jacob. Of course. How are the samples? Did you guys try everything? Yeah, unfortunately, they may not know what they all are. <laughs> By the time they got them, right? Well, guys, yeah, let's, let's again thank Laura and Jacob for their help here with us today. We want to thank the, uh, give them a hand. Yeah, thank you. We want to thank the uh, staff here at Bridgerland Culinary arts and over in the meat department that let us uh, prepare some of this product and thank you for preparing lunch and for your hospitality and uh, thanks to our vendors and thanks to all you guys for taking time to come you know every year we look at this and try and decide what what kind of uh, things can we present that we're not just being redundant and and it's tough because we have guys maybe that don't have a lot of experience to guys that have done this 30 years 
And so we hope this has been beneficial. What we did was took a look at what are the skill sets that are needed in today's shops. You look back, you know, when I started cutting in 1981 and even prior to that, what was it? It was carcass beef, right? So a lot of labor in the shop, um, a lot of boning and trim and so on. And then it went to boxed beef and there was some less, less of that. Then we went on to a, a block ready trim and then, you know, there's case ready product out there. And so there aren't as many guys back in the shop. There's not as much knife work being done. So our skill and our time needs to be spent on what do they need today. And that is just what we did here today. Uh, we need to be able to offer suggestions on what to cook, how to cook it, why you cook it the way you do. Um, that's how you're going to uh, build those relationships with your customers and bring them back to your store versus going somewhere else where they're not getting that kind of customer service. And so that's the skill set today. We need to be salespeople, we need to be consultants, and uh, as well as still being smart about how we cut, what we put out, and so on. So. You guys have a tough job. There's fewer and fewer of you. We're going to start working with the uh, color, or the uh, meat center here to put together an apprentice program so that hopefully we can be feeding your stores with guys that at least have some knowledge. And we'll work on that curriculum with them so that it's uh, information that they come out with and an understanding of those things that are valuable there in the shop today. So at any rate, with that, thank you all. We appreciate your taking part. Um, we are going to hold a drawing here um, in the next two weeks probably. We need to take a look at who joined us online and uh, then we're going to have a drawing that our uh, brokers and vendors have been kind enough to donate some uh, gift cards to and so let's make sure before you go uh, if, if we can get a list there maybe a pen and pad and get everybody's name and then we'll take a look online and include everybody in that. So just as a thank you to you guys, and we appreciate your support. Thanks.